You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Before we get to this week's guest, a 26-year member of the United States Army uh, who has multiple training certificates that have led him to the path he is now in helping veterans in their post-military career. We'll get to him in just a moment. But first, as a reminder, our normal announcements, follow us on social media, please. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. You guys are really slacking on this. We need to grow this social media following, and we need your help. So if you're not doing it already, please uh, do so, and then remind other people who are fans of the show to follow us on social media as well. Make sure you guys leave us Apple reviews, five-star reviews, if you feel so inclined. doesn't have to be a long review. Just give us five stars. Tell us what you like about the show that will help us grow this Hazard Ground community and continue to get bigger and better guests on the show. So we appreciate you guys giving us that short review and letting us know why you love the show. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. Uh, As we continue, go to our website, hazardground.com. I know the holidays are starting to come up. People may be doing some holiday shopping. If you're going to do holiday shopping, go to hazardground.com first. Click on the Amazon button on the homepage or on the bottom of the homepage or the Sponsors tab. It'll redirect you to Amazon. You'll do all your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we donate a percentage of that back to the charities and organizations that have come on the show and have been featured here, like the one that you'll hear later on today. All right, uh, let's get to this week's guest. He's a retired Army First Sergeant, spent 26 years in the military. Multiple deployments to Iraq, other deployments to Kosovo and Jordan, has been stationed all over America, Fort Bragg, Fort Campbell, Puerto Rico, Florida, Belgium, everywhere. Uh, He has been through major certifications throughout his military career, master resilience training, suicide intervention skills training, assist training for trainers, uh, you go crisis intervention, mental health training. All of this has led him to not only through fighting through his own personal journey, and currently working with the organization that he works with now that is called Director of, he's the Director of Pathways to Hope, uh, which helps incarcerated veterans get their lives back on track. He's also an author of a book called Guts, Grit, and the Grind, a Mental Mechanics Manual. He is Thomas Cruz joining us here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Tom, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. It's a great honor uh, to be invited to be on here. Um, I've seen you guys' past podcasts in a while, Um, just to be Asked to come on here is a, is a great honor. Uh, so thank you so much. We love telling stories. You know, and, and what, what interested me about yours more than anything, again, is I, I always appreciate um, when people are willing to share their own personal turmoil, their own personal experience that they've now overcome and pivoted into starting to help other people. Because I can't tell you the number of times we've heard from people who, you know, respond to the show, send us emails, you know, give us DMs on social media. Hey, I, you know, this guest said exactly what I was feeling and exactly what I was thinking. And it's great to know that there's somebody else out there who's thinking what I'm feeling and and things of that nature. So, you know, it's it's just for us, it's great to have uh, that level of connectivity between our guests and and our listeners. So obviously great to have you here. But 26 years uh, started at some point in time. How and where did you get in the Army? Uh, so, uh, that's a, that's a funny story within itself. So I was, um, uh, I'm the oldest of two brothers, uh, three brothers. I have two younger brothers than me. And then I had a, a great family life, right? Um, I had a mother and father that were very caring. Um, both of them had dropped out of high school basically to have me. Um, and so I'm the first one to graduate high school, the first one to go to college, um, first one to graduate college, even though it took me 20 years to get my bachelor's degree, I got it right when I was retiring. Slow and steady so, wins that race, Tom, slow and steady. I got it. So the, the four year people, people like me you, only ended up spending a lot of money. All you old people that you still do it. Right. Um, but so I, um, how I got into the army is I actually, my family ended up, um, uh, splitting, uh, my parents ended up getting a divorce. And so that caused a real rift within my family, uh, separating the family a lot. And I did get a, a, a ride, a full ride to a private college uh, because I was, again, I was a very good student, um, all that stuff. And I got a full ride, but then I couldn't cope with a lot of the family issues. And then it dropped my college down. And then I ended up on academic probation uh, in college. Wow. And so um, I was kind of like scared and wondering. And then the army was the first one to call me and say, hey, we got these great deals for you. And so I was like, oh, let me go down and find out what deal you have for me. <laughs> and so I got down there and I was like, well, I want this. And they're like, no, nope, we'll give you this. And we're like, all right, fine. And so um, 
because I wanted to escape my family life and I wanted to escape the school life that I couldn't uh, couldn't keep up with. Um, I joined the army as a mechanic uh, slash with airborne uh, airborne under it because I wanted to travel the world, see the world and uh, do some cool stuff. So I, I joined as a mechanic you know, with the airborne option. So you felt like jumping out of planes. Uh, did you did you know uh, outside of the airborne stuff that I mean, did you have any sort of inkling what that would lead throughout the rest of your career? I mean, look, I, I, I worked in the ordinance world, right? Like, you know, us mechanics, they're the meek of the earth guys. But you know what? They love turning wrenches and they love fixing vehicles. And it's, it's a passion. And it's, you know, it's one of those things. It's, it's one of those thankless jobs in the military. But, you know, um, you guys know your worth and you know your value because without our equipment, we're dead in, mm -hmm. in the water or on the land or dead everywhere. So, yeah. so my dad was a, a mechanic. He actually mm -hmm. worked at the Ford plant in Cleveland up oh, wow. until they shut it down. And so that's where I kind of got it. I was always outside with him trying to learn how to fix stuff. And I was never really good at it. So I was like, oh, this sounds good. This follows with my dad's path and all that. And I was like, I'll be a mechanic. And then jumping from planes, I just thought it was cool. I had never been in a plane. The first time I was in a plane was when they kicked me out. And they <laughs> actually kicked me out. So the first jump that you got to do, you got to do five of them to qualify. Mm -hmm. I actually froze in the door. And next thing I feel is that the air behind me as I'm thrusted out the door by a foot um flying through the air and then ever since then that first day in 1995 it was uh i think it was october of 95 um i've just loved it loved the the peacefulness um you know the the, the shoot being pulled sucks but then that peacefulness just floating there looking at the earth all the quietness and then all of a sudden yeah, the ground comes fast and that isn't fun either but uh yeah, I jumped for 14 years, loved every bit of it, became a master jump master. And then right after that, ma master blaster in uh, 2002. I mean, uh, on this path that you set yourself on, I'm sure you thought that it was going to be pretty straightforward. Um, kind of in retrospect, when you went through everything you went through, did you did you ever think that just being a mechanic was going to get you through all this stuff? No, um, I, I was with the elite. So I was with the 82nd for the first five years coming out right. uh, again, not by choice. They told me because you're airborne, here you go. Uh, so I hated it. I really do. But looking back <laughs> on it, it was, it was really made me who I am now. The, the first sergeants I had, my companions that I have, I'm still, I'm friends still with the very first, first sergeant I had. I'm still friends with the, my roommate from 1995 when I first joined, actually wow. we went through basic and AIT together and or AIT and airborne school together. And we're still friends with, I'm still friends with all of them. Uh, so no, I really didn't expect to get where I am now. And from there, I ended up going to, like I said, I went to fit, uh, I went to 82nd and then 99 Kosovo kicked off. I was part of the 82nd, went into uh, Kosovo, did that. And then I came back March of 2000. Uh, so I survived Y2K in Europe. And uh, they, yeah, I come off the plane and they're like, hey, um, you got orders. I'm like, man, I just got back. Like, I literally just came back from where am I going now? And they're like, oh, you're going to Puerto Rico. You're going to be part of a uh, seventh group. I was like, oh, OK, I'll go. Yeah. When, when yeah. can I go? How fast can I get there? <laughs> <laughs> nice little deal they gave you there, right? Um, and you get, you, you know, I mean. Kosovo is Kosovo, right? Like nothing really happened there, right? And I don't say that as a pejorative. It just, it, well, tell me then. I mean, I, you know, what were you guys involved in? Because most of the people I've talked about say it was pretty slow for the most part. Yes, there were like bombings and air raid campaigns and things of that nature. But other than that, it wasn't like there was no ground fighting or anything for us. It wasn't a lot of ground fighting because uh, fortunate enough, the Air Force had been in there for like 90 some days. Right. And so a lot of us were waiting across the border or waiting uh, wherever we were to, to get in. And by the time we got was able to get in, yeah, the Air Force had done majority of the damage. But we there was still pockets of resistance. Um, there were still buildings that we had to clear. Um, there were still a lot of, uh, you know, we were there building something. We were living in tents still in the Coast Vokes. Bond Steel was, when I was at Bond Steel, it was wheat field, uh, uh, tents and cots and everything. We were still, you know, j uh, barbed wire jail. Um, and we were still taking hits. We still lost a lot of guys, um, to landmines. Um, I would have oh, to really? go recover vehicles. Um, and because of the years and years and years and years of them putting landmines everywhere, uh, it was real dangerous. A lot of times to be able to go out and you'd have to recover vehicles that had hit one or that people had planted in the middle of the road. Uh, because it, again, back then, even still, we were a, a creature of our habits. They knew which way we were coming in and out and they would set some stuff up. Um, so yeah, it wasn't full on, you know, uh, one on one, not like an Iraq, Afghanistan, but it still, it was at that time, it was still, 
you know, a little hot and a little, we still ran into um, a lot of hurt feelings and, and people's resistance. So, and then yeah. we've had the Pristina incident where we went up and helped the French guard the bridge. Um, so there was still a lot of back and forth um, uh, stuff going on. Uh, just not, a, and not, not like what people would think of right now, what we've been through. Yeah. Um, so your experience at seventh group, which for those who don't know, each SF group sort of works in a concentration of the world. Uh, seventh group has, has South America, Latin America, which, you know, you didn't get stuck in the sweltering rainforest jungles of Uruguay. You get freaking Puerto Rico. How lucky are you? Uh Oh, Oh man. Did you just lose power? Oh, we didn't. Oh, there we go. Now you're back. See, look at that. We, we overcome all the challenges here on the hazard ground. Man. So, uh, yeah, so I got sent down to uh, Puerto Rico, and so they had been in. So I was part of C three seven, which is a uh, a group specialized group mm-hmm. of there. So it's a, fa- a quick reaction group for South America, and each each group has a quick reaction group that's stationed around the world. And they were in Panama, and then when we gave Panama back, um, we were we moved to Puerto Rico. So I was there for three years. I was there from two thousand two thousand three, and, and yeah, our, our our main feature was the down in uh, all of South America. We had the, the mission when the civilians got uh, wrapped up in Colombia. That was part of our one of our missions. Um, then when we uh, when they wanted Vieques back from the bombing from the Navy, because we was on a Navy base and they gave the Vieques back to Puerto Rico. Um, then that's when we got left that area, too. So in 2003, they uh, all of the special ops teams and Navy and everyone moved out of that location and moved back to the States, to their home bases. Uh, they asked me to come back to Fort Bragg. I said, man, I already been to Fort Bragg for five years. I'm good. And uh, so I ended up getting sent over to uh, fifth group out of uh, Kentucky where I spent mm. from 03 to 09 uh, with fifth group, which is where all my uh, deployments and I was part of uh, first battalion and then part of the specialized team uh, over there too. Okay. So we're going to run into some crossfire here because I was with fifth group in Iraq in 05 to 06. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> Cause now that I'm just looking down your, your resume here. I'm like, wait a minute. I didn't realize you were with fifth group then. Um, so we'll, we'll probably uh, know some people of the same people here, but nonetheless, uh, so you're, you're in Puerto Rico on nine 11. Um, and yeah. you know, I, I know everybody was in, at least in the special ops community was itching to go somewhere immediately. Were you guys thinking you were going to leave immediately and go somewhere? So when 9-11 hit, uh, I was a mechanic still at the time. I did transfer over once I was in fifth group to a different MOS. But yeah, I was a mechanic still. And so basically when that hit, we were watching the news. We thought we were going to go somewhere. We didn't know where we were going to go. We didn't know what. So we we got, we got were already prepped. Like we're already a team that's already prepped to go anywhere, anytime. So it really didn't matter. But what we did was we started uh, prepping our surroundings because we knew, okay, if this could happen, where it was happening in the Pentagon, the White House was a target. We knew the towers. Um, okay, so we basically moved all the civilians out of the area that we are a part of the base. We blocked it off. I uh, moved vehicles in place um, to barricade our, we had, uh, you know, soldiers all over uh, on top of our buildings uh, prepped and ready. And so, yeah, we were just awaiting our orders of um, does this affect us and where do they need us? Uh, we knew our, our area, South America, we know that it doesn't matter in the world everywhere. Got bad guys, you know, there's not just middle East or other. A lot of these guys are stationed also sure. all around the world. Yeah. Uh, so we were just waiting for feedback of what we need they to do. Um, we didn't end up getting sent anywhere. We ended up just being continued to stay on standby and as necessary uh, moving, but we didn't end up moving anywhere. All right. You said you changed MOSs when you got to Fort Campbell. What'd you end up doing? So I was a mechanic for a while when I got to Fort Campbell, but then my, I started when I was in seventh group uh, to go to counterintelligence Okay. Uh, because I knew I had a lot of job offers being a mechanic because uh, I was a senior mechanic at the time and I had a lot of job offers, but I, I was like, what am I going to do when I'm going to retire? Am I going to go work in a Jiffy Lube, changing batteries and tires? Like, really, that's how I saw my future, right? I didn't, I was like, this isn't what I want to do. I want to, you know, spend all this time and be a Jiffy Lube guy. Um, so I want to do No disrespect cool. to Jiffy Lube, by the way. None at all whatsoever. I use Jiffy Lube. <laughs> I um, I'm a regular. But I didn't, want to, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be, I wanted to try to go. So I got into the Intel world and became a counterintelligence agent because I okay. thought it was cool and spooky and yeah. all that stuff. It's not. Oh. Um, <laughs> Um, it's good times, you know, working, uh, with the group guys and doing stuff. What we did, uh, I ended up getting cross-trained as an interrogator, uh, because that's what the team guys understood uh, yeah. better. 
Uh, now, <laughs> under, the team guys didn't understand counterintelligence because they have an 18 series for that, an analyst. Uh, so I cross-trained my, my guys and myself were, as an interrogator. Now they knew what that was, and that became beneficial of, of where I could use both my skill sets to help benefit the teams. That's uh, that's interesting. You know, it's um, one of the fortunate things about uh, being in the SF community. If you're not a tabbed guy, um, is they'll use you for anything you're good at, right? They will, they will, they will find what they need you for uh, and exploit your strengths for their benefit, which mm-hmm. is what any good team does, right? If in, yep. in in Basketball, if you're a great three-point shooter, but you don't do anything else, they put you in the right spot just to make three-pointers, right? That's it. That's all That's all they need you to do. So it's sort of the same mentality. Um, I was not supposed to be on interrogations, but I got to go through a couple of them. Um, both as a uh, – I didn't really get to ask many questions. I was just there to be the physical enforcer, if you will. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I, I loved it. I was part of uh, A15. Mm-hmm. Um, majority of the time I was part of 1st Battalion and went out um, all my deployments. Most of my deployments were with A15 at that time, uh, which got to do a lot of uh, – I got to do a lot of cool stuff. And what I liked about being able to be on a, on a team and being able to be impactful there was, like, just like you guys – you know, there's only 12 guys on a team and everybody knew their mission. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed being the only guy on a team and everyone needed my expertise, right? They needed me to be effective in what I did and be good at what I do. And so uh, my team was very good. All my guys were sent out to teams all around and as individual because they were really, really good. I loved my team. They were a great bunch of guys. And I was fortunate enough to be able to be on there. And what I liked about the, the team aspect was, I was able to see it. I worked really close with the analysts, not only the team analysts, but our, our the non-tabbed analysts. And we was able to build a target, right? You build a target, say, hey, this is who we're going to go after. And you research and you research, research, and then be able to go out with the team and go hit that target. Yep. And then me being able to actually, you know, say jackpot, got them and be able to then interrogate them right there and try to get, okay, is there follow on missions or what information does he have? Or did we get everything we needed? And then taking him from there, taking him back to a facility, doing the interrogations in a facility where it's funny because a lot of them, I was always geared up and then I would change into clothes like this. And they would be able to try to tell me a story like, Oh man, you don't believe, you don't understand what that guy did to me. And you don't understand. And he did this and this. And I'd be like laughing because it was me. Like, no, I know what I did on target. I know what I told you and asked you. So don't play that with games and then be able to get information from them only to build another packet and go do another hit. Right. Right. Um, or another mission. So for me in my world and in the Intel side, a lot of us don't get to see that we get to see pieces and parts of it. What parts we do, you know, you're either part of the building the packet, maybe part of the interrogation afterwards or on the hit. I got to see the full spectrum of the whole Intel process for my, from both the counterintelligence side and the interrogation side which was beautiful. Um, and I really, you know, I, I, I loved my team. I loved working out with those guys. And um, I, I finally earned the respect because as you know, it's um, it's, it's earned, not given. 100%. Um, if you're yep. a dirt bag, then you're not on the team and you're, and you're treated a certain way. So I was, I, I gained a lot of respect from the, the team and all my guys did too. Um, we went into a lot of, all of our rotations, all of our guys, did some spectacular, spectacular things. And we're a part of some spectacular uh, missions that have gone down in history and, and, and stuff like that, that I'm very, um, I'm very proud of, of not only the work that I did, but my team did. Hold that thought. I want to get back to some of those missions, but I, I feel like I need to compare notes with you um, on 05 to 06. So you were with first bat. I was with second bat when they were there um, in 05 to 06. We were at RPC. Where were you okay. guys? So I was at RPC. You were. Yeah. Did we eat in the same dining hall at some point in time? Because I feel like we probably I would, did. I would say so. So you were at the, the castle, right? Yeah. 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 With the swimming pool and they mortared it only once. They yeah. only able to hit it once. Yeah. 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 I, I, that's crazy. We literally probably crossed paths in the same operations center in the castle and, I, and didn't I even know it. I guarantee we I didn't go it. near the, the, the intelligence guys. I was nervous. I got, I got scared of you guys. You're, well, I was a, so at that time I was a mechanic, right? No, no, I think oh, 05. Six, I turned yeah. Intel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I did turn Intel. So because I did go the first time uh, I went out there a visit a couple times was as a mechanic. And then, yeah, the rest of my time was out there as an Intel guy. So, wow, I was out there for um, I was out there for Doug uh, for do, Mesa. Do you remember uh, Sergeant Major Dwayne Dwayne Cox? Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, yes. That dude, I tried to get him on this show. He won't come on. I'm, I'm really. He won't come on. I oh, want to get if you if you got any if you got any juice with him, let me know. I mean, he was he was the uh, company sergeant major for the SF company that was there. Um, that dude. I mean, I I love that guy genuinely. Like he is just the most abrasive a hole you'll ever meet, but you mm-hmm. love him. Like you absolutely love him. Uh, and I can't remember who was my first sergeant. My first sergeant was the one that had the amputeed leg. And he ended up becoming Sar Major and then ended up being uh, the Army representative for the SOCOM. I think it was a SOCOM uh, warrior team. I would have remembered you know, an right? amputee. I didn't come across right. any of them. Yeah, he was a, he's a team guy. First Sar uh-huh. of, uh, of first bat. And uh, he ended up uh, making Sar Major and all that. And he was, it was the worst thing in the world because you'd be out there running. And all of a sudden, you'd hear him running and you'd hear that leg. And you'd feel bad because, like, if he was he would jump, he was still doing halo jumps and everything that's, with, with yeah, well, listen, those guys down in nice. combat. So was, that's another thing I loved about uh, I loved about those guys. They were always trying to itch to get out there and make sure that we were doing good things. And no matter what they, it's a lot of their downfalls or things that happened to them, they still fought through it and, and got out there and, and, and did it. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, that's small world, right? Uh, how how we uh, probably crossed paths and didn't even know it um, yeah, throughout the time. That's awesome. I, I, I was in charge of the ISOF support battalion. Those are okay, the guys yeah. I, I stood up and trained. So, you know, we had ICTF, 36th, and and I was a support battalion guy. So I built the whole support battalion, stood it up, armed it, refitted it, outfitted it, and trained it. So that's what I did for a year there um, in, in, in that job, which was awesome. It was the best experience of the 23-plus years that I've been in the military was that deployment. So yeah, we lost a, we lost a guy out there that worked with those guys, uh, Staff Sergeant May- Maseth. Mm-hmm. He had, uh, he, uh, we lost him down over there. He was in charge of the ISOF team and a freak, uh, freak shower incident, um, yeah. ground rooting and stuff. So yeah, we, yep, we were there at the same time. And <laughs> small, small world. Um, okay. So between three deployments and three successive years and in the SF world, their deployments are only about seven months. So it's not, you know, you know, weren't there for three years consecutively. So you get a little bit of a break in between, but, uh, you mentioned some of these missions that you did a moment ago that were, um, you know, of historic nature. Want to care to share some of the background and details? Um, we were actually in the the command center for the the Chris Kyle. Oh, um, really? I did not realize that until the movie came out. Um, huh. because that I didn't I I didn't know who he was, or I don't think anybody really knew who he was right. when we were actually in in. Um, and then yeah, so a lot of those missions when they were they were put, putting up those barriers, and then you know the. Uh, the normal engineer guys were just getting hit every night. Um, you know, we put a team out there finally to figure out who was, you know, who was hitting them each night. And yeah. Uh, so we were out there for those. And, uh, because I was with a one five, I would get called from the battalion down to go down and work with them. Uh, so being able to work with the, um, Iraqi, uh, special forces team and working with their interrogators and being able to go on missions, mm-hmm. uh, being able to work with, uh, one of my deployments was strictly with A15, so being able to work with multiple um, other agencies or uh, out there, and then being able to uh, work with foreign countries, um, uh, special elite, uh, was pretty cool. Uh, being able to go out on missions with them and and see how they operate um, and how they do interrogations or how they handle certain missions was was pretty unique too. So uh, yeah, fortunate enough, we were we were in a lot of stuff and we we got through them all. Um, being able to work with you know, the, the other group from Bragg, uh, the behind the fence guys, uh, was great. And then just being able to work with the air support, you know, I just, ne- I never knew until I got in the spec ops, the special ops side and then working, um, being a deployments, how big that is and who's all involved with it and how, you know, intricate, intricate it all is. And, uh, I have a definitely a, a, a you know, a definite a soft spot for them, but then being able to see how that works for the conventional side, like a lot right. of my deployments were all on the, the, the special ops side. So I got to see all the goodness, um, but then being able to go talk uh, and see how my uh, some of my friends were that were doing it on the regular side and the struggles they had to with interpreters or, you know, struggles of being able to go on missions like for us missions were like we were told a mission and you go. There was no go green light. It did become a little more political. There was hits. You know, you can do it only if he's here. Or yep. People were on a, on a target list, but then they became not on a they, target list. The SF community didn't mind swinging and missing as much as the conventional community does. Yes. You know, and that's because the conventional was doing a lot more political. They were trying to do. Well, the and they're also not willing, they're not willing to assume the risk, right? They they, they know you know the old if you're going to make an omelet, got to break a few eggs adage. Um, I think the special ops community one, they're more 
highly trained, so the risk is mitigated by their training. But they're mm-hmm. also, again, you know, I think the conventional forces, and I know the conventional forces because I spent the majority of my career in it, aren't willing, most commanders aren't willing to assume the risk for something that doesn't pay off. You go get the bad guy, we can we can sort of, and for those who are civilians listening, look, you have to understand some of this transactional, and that's not being callous to the people who are lost or anything like that, but it's easier to write off people getting hurt or killed when you get the bad guy. When you show up, miss, and nothing's there, and people get hurt and killed, that's when commanders end up losing their job for making a bad decision, and they're not willing to make those decisions, which is why you have to double, triple check everything before the conventional force really takes action. And that's the difference between, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, exercising the, philo- the the nine principles of war to your advantage versus waiting, right? C- speed, initiative, uh, you know, economy of force all are on your side. When you go, 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 you give those things up for the most part when you wait, 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 wait. And the training is just more specialized. So like, yes. even though, you know, I was, I, I would deploy and I would come home. I never really came home. I came home. I had to recertify and not only do an interrogation stuff and make sure that my skill sets were up, but then I was working with my team. So we'd be going traveling around to shoot houses, to drive schools, to this or that, or we spend all the time on a range or we spend it, you know, know, what's the next mission? Because again, we did have the same rotation and went to the same spot each year. So we were able to go, okay, we're going back to this area. So we know we got to, you know, this is what's hot. And we'd stay on, and especially for me on the Intel side, being have to stay on top of who's still around, who's a target, who's not a target. Um, what's the new dynamics? What's the new culture? Um, you know, what was going on now? What was the new, the new buzz in, in that country? What was the best get that you ever got as far as a target is concerned? You don't have to get into names and details and everything else, but I mean, you know, obviously, you know, everybody has to understand the intelligence community is obviously more sensitive in nature. So um, without, you know, whatever details you can share, but, you know, it's one of those things where there's always somebody that you were lusting after and chasing and chasing and chasing, and boom, finally you got. So there was a, um, there was a mission where the perpetrators had gone in and had like our uniforms and our vehicles and had gone in on the command center um, there was a high power, a lot of important people. Uh, they had um, raided the building, took some of our people, and actually we found our people in those vehicles down the road. And so our main mission was to find that um, that cell and those guys and, and, and capture them. And so we ended up finding, uh, my team ended up finding the finance finance team. And we all the money. Up, <laughs> we, uh, we end up rolling up the whole finance team and it was a great joy for me and for us because we were able to be part of the solution of that. We were able to bring um, redemption back to our guys that had been lost um, due to these guys sneaking through and, and, and thinking they were going to get away with it and thought they, they were clever and then doing what they did to our soldiers. Um, yeah, it, that, was, that was probably one of the biggest wins for me was being able to dismantle that, that portion because... Um, yeah, it was uh, it was payback. It was, it was really payback. It was retribution. Like, okay, you guys think you're that slick? We can find you anywhere, and and we did. So, for me, that was being able to give back to some of those families that saying, you know, we did a, we did a part of dismantling that 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 group that really um, caused a lot of harm. Yeah, and and again, I think the um, what's the word we're looking for here? I mean, success, but it's also the the. Uh, accomplishment of doing that you know it's sometimes it's laborious and uh you know I'll I'll defer to you obviously in the intel world but you know it's sometimes you don't know if you're chasing your own tail sometimes you don't know if the the path you're going down is going to lead and yield fruit as opposed to a dead end um and there's uncertainty and all that right and like Mm -hmm. we just talked about a moment ago there's risk in getting that information it's not just freely given to you uh and every time you have to try to you know follow up on a lead uh, and you and you take those risks, uh, you know, it, for it not to work out is utterly disappointing for you guys. Um, it, it's and, and that's and one of the examples of that is I had a guy that I took down um, a propaganda cell, and I had this guy that we had captured at first, and he just every night, every night I talked to him, he gave me a new target, and so I was like, all right, cool, here we go, we got another target. So we hit that target, we hit the target every like for like four, I think it was like four or five nights in a row. He kept giving me good information. I was like, all right, we got, I got it. The problem was, you know, the other guy started figuring out who was the one giving them up. They're like, man, why is all our guys right? So the final mission um, that he had given us was like this guy's to go after 
we hit the house and the person had moved out and it was a new family in there. And so we're like, oh man, like, oh, we're sorry. Like, oh, you're not who's supposed to be in here. Um, and, but the problem was they had been waiting for us. And so they, they ambushed us. Um, and luckily with the support of our other brothers, um, that were there to be able to help us out, we got out of that real safe. Uh, we got out of there safely. Um, we had to fight our way out, but, um, that just shows that like, you know, we were, we were making a dent, we were making, we were making noise. And at some point, um, so they, they figured it out too. And, uh, that's when we really had to look like, okay, what's the length of Intel? How, how real, what's the bang for the buck? Like how long is somebody's information good before, um, somebody else goes, wait a second. That's the only guy, that's the guy that only knew everything. And so all of a sudden this guy gets popped off. This guy's get captured this guy. Oh, wait a second. And put the pieces together. And we ran that, ran that one all the way to, to the drive to almost, you know, a, an issue for us. Did you end up ever finding that one guy? No, no, because by really? the time, because that guy, the guy that was getting off the information swore up and down. And I was like, no, I believe you because you've been credible for all these other ones. So I'm not doubting you. My, my philosophy is obviously the other side had finally figured out who was giving him up. So everybody that was associated with him now had scattered. So um, now my main focus was, okay, now what do I do with this guy? And we had the judicial, judicial system under us. So I was able to take all of the stuff he had given us and blah, blah, and then present that to the Iraqi courts. And um, they handled them from there. Um, so we really never got to finish, finish it, but we, uh, we definitely did a lot of, a lot of hurting on that side for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess a lot of people don't realize that um, when you're in a protracted, pro protracted combat, the way we were, in Iraq, and it's not, you're not taking large swaths of land or, or trying to take territory back, right? Like, you know, World War II, you were trying to take France back from the Germans, right? So there was always an advancing movement you were on. For lack of a better term, you know, we spent most of Iraq in a defensive posture with the exception of several units who were looking for, you know, needles in a stack of needles, if you will. Um, and so when you're in that defensive posture, it's always, there's, there's a chess match, you know, we do something, the enemy counters. We counter to that. They recounter again, and round and round we go. And that's sort of what you know. Years of combat in Iraq were. It was just one tactic and technique that we used. That the enemy figured out something else to do, and then we had to change and try to stay ahead of those guys. And that's you know what you did for I don't know what eleven years <laughs> in there. So you know, uh, or ten years, whatever it was that we were in Iraq. So uh, that that certainly leads to the fact that you know when you're and the same thing in the intelligence community. You're just constantly trying to gain information, and they're constantly trying to prevent you from accessing it. So, yep. um, you know, and again, I, I, I'm always so curious with you guys, um, you know, how much of what you do sort of ate at you internally. Like, you start to end up, you know, for lack of a better term, falling in love with capturing the person that you're chasing. And it becomes all consuming. Was that the case for you? Um, I really enjoyed the interrogations portions because um, for me, it was always a mental game. Um, I, 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 I figured it was like chess. So talking to you is like, everyone always asks me, so did you do waterboarding? Did you do this? It's like, that stuff doesn't exist. Like, no, no, I never even saw that stuff. Never even heard of it, blah, blah. I would literally, for me, it was sitting across from the person. I know they're bad. They know I know they're bad. I got to get them to admit they're bad. And so it became a mental game for me. I really just enjoyed the cat and mouse. I enjoyed now I was under obviously a time time crunch because, you know, we're setting up for the next mission. I didn't have time. So I became really good in, in playing what they what they wanted to hear, what they needed to hear, um, you know, and, and play a lot of the training that I had been given both by, you know, the, the my regular training, but working with the teams for so long being able to, you know, and learning the culture. And that's really a key to a lot of successes of anything we ever do in any, any future stuff is really, I learned a lot about their culture, how they operate, what they fall in love with, how they did it. I did that on target. And I did that in the booth, in the booth when I was doing, it. I was like, what did they like? What is their culture? Like, how do they react to certain things? What buttons can you push um, to get them to react in a certain way and then feed off those reactions? Cause all I need you to do is give me a foot in that door. You give me a foot in that door. I'm going to play it. Um, and so, uh, for me, it was, it was a lot of mental game. Uh, it was very, uh, re very rewarding to be able to get somebody to finally admit or, or, or believe me that I really was there for their best interest. Um, when really it was in the best interest of our country, our mission, what we were doing. 
Um, and a lot of these guys, I got to be able to turn around to and say, you know, yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand what I was doing or yeah, you know, you know, we've just been doing it for so long like this. Um, and we ended up keeping a lot of guys just for, um, historical knowledge, right. Being able to keep them for me to be able to go in there and learn, well, what's your culture? Like you guys have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Educate me. How do you guys operate? Why do you talk? Why do you act the way you do? Why do you not like who you don't like? Or what is the history? Like I'm a big history guy. So for me, just going in there and talking to somebody, I would just get gain so much information that I could use later on to help me be better at what I did. Yeah. Um, Right up there with, why don't you guys know how to use a Western style toilet? That was always a perplexing thing. Um, I remember having to show the Iraqis that that was always a, that was a fun day. Uh, but back to your interrogations as I try to lighten the mood here. Was there one person you remember that you couldn't break, that you couldn't get to? That was, that was Man, extra why tough. you got to bring that up? Out well, of all my times. I, I mean, listen, one... if I'm going to ask about all your victories, I got to ask about some of the defeats, man. You didn't go undefeated. I know. I didn't. There was one guy. One guy I could not I could not get get to um, get to break basically I couldn't get him to he just sat there kept just repeating what he wanted to say and uh, wouldn't give me any information kept claiming he's and I had all the evidence like I literally like that mission that we went on to get him to he was staying in a place so it's like going somewhere I'm not going to use the example it's, it's what it is what so I went to a place. And he ended up uh, being in a building that had a lot of other criminals in it. Mm -hmm. So when we did the hit on the building, those criminals thought we were after them. And so we were really looking for somebody else. And we got the guy that we were looking for. But then it erupted into a big firefight because the other guys thought we were coming after them, even though we never knew who they even were, or why they were in there. And so when we actually finally got out and all that, um, he kept claiming he wasn't. We had already gone through, we got everything that I needed. Um, I just needed him to tell me some more. And he just, he just was very resistant. I even, um, like, like you said at the beginning, I even had my analyst um, try to talk to him because um, my, usually my analyst sat behind um, the guy so that whatever information I was looking for, uh, he would be able to input. But if that guy said something different or special or something that maybe he needed, then he was jotting it down and he wanted to ask, uh, he was like, Hey, can I ask him some questions? I was like, yeah, go ahead. And it didn't go well. And the guy just, the guy just would not, you know, answer, but we had enough on him alone for what we needed him for. So it was fine that we couldn't. It's just, for me, it was, it, it, it always, it, it's, it's like, man, can I get one more try? Can I get one more chance? Can I, come on, man. Like, it's just a, uh, yeah, I had one, I only had one guy that I couldn't, or that even though I, t I turned over to a fellow interrogator that was with us, um, they couldn't, they couldn't get him to talk either. So uh, this guy had just either didn't really know nothing or was really good, really, really well trained. Right. Um, was there a one of those one of those interrogations where somebody had said something to you that you remember that you weren't prepared for? I mean, look, I, I generally everybody I know in the intel community when they do interrogations, they know the answers to the question before they ask it. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not in there searching for you know, information that they don't know. They, they, they're just supplementing information they already have. So under that premise, was there ever a time where somebody told you something and you're like, oh, damn, I didn't expect to hear that? Um, not really. Okay. I mean. So basically what you're two, saying is the, you never were caught off guard. Good for you. <laughs> well, the, the two times, so like the one guy, like the one guy that ended up being, you know, I used four or five times. Like I was very uh, surprised, I guess, for him to, one be as uh open and honest like like really when we were on target he was like oh yeah this guy yeah he lives over here he's only two blocks away you want to go he's like do you, he's like he's only two blocks away do you want to go sure and then we get there and he's like yeah but this other guy lives over here okay what I, just you keep showing us where to go we'll do so we ended up with like three hits in one night when we we're only supposed to do one we ended up going splitting forces three times to go to three other, three other locations or two other locations upon that. So I was just like, okay. And then each time he was like, every time I talked to him, he was like, yeah, he's like, and I'll show you, you give me a map. And then if you want, I'll go with you. Like, you want me to show you where he's at? I was like, well, man, you're making this too easy for me. Like, okay, sure. Like, yeah, do what you need to do. Um, when the guys were very willing then like that, because of the targets we were hitting and the people we were actually going after, I was surprised usually of how willingly of information they were given up once they were captured. Right. Um, so I guess that really was the offsetting to me was 
they would it, it didn't take much for them to give up the information that they had um once and really like i said it, it, it was just talking to them like i really i didn't do nothing to them i wasn't yelling i wasn't forceful i just sit there and talk to them it was just like hey man i got all day here like this is what i do so we'll talk as long as you want to talk or don't talk and they ended up opening up so it was it was i guess those were the most surprising things of as high level as they were for them to be that open all right so you go through this kind of vicious three year cycle from a standpoint of deployment you know return home retrain deployment return home retrain deployment from 05 to 08 and all of this stuff that you're doing while you're making it seem fun and glamorous and easy and you know it, it's very transactional and matter of fact um whether you acknowledge it or not at the time all this stuff is starting to have an effect on you and it's sort of eating you away under the surface um did you recognize at any point in time that the amount of stress that you were under the amount of work that you were doing the amount of pressure that you had on yourself was having any sort of effect on you the the only time no, and no no because like i said i was the head of my family i was the first one to complete this first one to do this i was on elite teams I was like riding high. My, my, me and my team were the best of the best. We were doing great things, doing awesome. Like, you know, I was working with the best in the world. So I was like, I was like, no. And so I never, never saw me having any issues. And if you even ask my wife now, like, I don't think I have issues. I'll still deny them you until 26 years. Right. Um, but my first bout with what I started feeling that I did have issues was my uh, NCOIC, um, when we were at RPC, he had been, he was an E8 um, and he had made, you know, he'd been deployed a bunch of time way. He'd been with fifth group, like a long time, a long, long time. And he had been all, all over the place. And he was like, he asked me and another buddy of mine. Um, I remember it was April, April of 08. And we were supposed to come back in May of 08. And he goes, Hey, can you, can you bring the guys back home? I got to get home. And I said, sure, I, I, you know, me and me and him can bring him home. It's not a big deal. He's like, yeah, my kid's not doing good in school. Let, you know, I got to get back. I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. He gets back. Um, he was having more. It wasn't about the kids. It was having more uh, other issues in his family. Um, he ended up uh, killing himself. And so that got back to the unit, obviously. Me and that guy flew back, um, buried him, presented the flag to his family, came back got the guys, told the guys what happened, got the guys back, held another, another ceremony for them, um, for the, through the team. And, um, they really messed with me, they really, really messed with me bad. Um, so I went and sought help and I sought help off base. Cause I didn't want, you know, people to know, I didn't really want So I was like, went and saw it off base. I went and sought help. Um, and the person was a civilian. Um, in, in what form was the help, Tom? Sorry. A therapist. Just a ther saw, okay. All right. Went and saw a therapist. Um, it was a it was a resource through the military, but it was off base. And so, um, again, it was done through a civilian and, and we can get in this later. I'm, it's not, I don't have a bashing against civilians, but she didn't understand what I was going through. She didn't understand the bonding. She didn't understand that. So she just told me I was grieving and she just said, you'll be OK. You're going to be fine. And I kept going, no, this is really messing with me. And they're like, no, that's just part of the process. And you're just you're going to be OK. And we talked like this for like 30 minutes and I didn't feel better. Actually, I felt worse. And so I had told her at the end, I said, your, your help right now to me, uh, it was useless. And I rode my motorcycle in the, that day. And I said, you know what, what you're, what, what you gave me, I feel like riding my, my motorcycle into a wall right now. I said, that's about how helpful you were. And she just kind of was laughing. and was like, no, you just grieve and you're going to be okay. And so from that day on up until my incident, I never went and sought help again, because I felt that if this is the help that I was going to get, for something that I thought was serious, then I will never go and get help again. And I don't have time for this. So I um, never went back and sought help up until I had no choice. Okay. Um, so you're at this sort of critical point where you feel like you have no choice. So what is your next step? Uh, well, so I just continue to work with the teams. I ended up leaving fifth group, not because I wanted to, I would have stayed there for my whole career. I made uh, E8. Mm -hmm. And so then at that point there, at that time, um, there were no E8 um, CI positions in group. Now they're open to up to be able to be first sergeants and all that now over there. But at the time that I was there, all three of us E8s had to go find new jobs. And so I had applied for an SMU. 
Um, and I got not accepted to the one that I wanted. SMU? I I'm sorry. I, I, why do I not know that? Special mission unit. Okay. That's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. And so I went to, I went to one, um, and I was stationed in, uh, Maryland at the time. And I was part of this unit and I had, uh, I had a breakdown. Um, uh, in what way? I was, I was being groomed to be Sergeant Major. I had been, you know, I had been running, I had a perfect record. I had perfect everything. You know, my NCOERs were one ones every for ever, ever in a day. I was being groomed to be Sergeant Major. And then, um, yeah, 3 November uh, 2010, uh, which is almost 12 years to the day, um, I had a breakdown. Um, I don't remember a lot of it. And the parts that I do um, remember are not good. So everything that I will tell you is coming from the perspective of my fiance, which is now my wife. Um, I held her hostage and was going to kill the both of us. And uh, I had blocked the doors. I had sent out text messages. But before that, I had left. I had taken everything in the house the, electronically and I had left. And I went to a location that I don't remember. Um, I think I know, but I don't know. And I came back to the house and the discussion um, between my wife and I, there was two different versions. The version she remember, she knows and the version I remember. Well, give me, what you, remember. give me what you remember first. So what I remember is I ended up coming uh, and I had, I had my weapon. I have a, a had a pistol. I come back in the house and my, what I remember is coming in the house and we were living on a three, three, uh, three floor condominium. I, next thing I remember is her, her being in bed and me trying to uh, tell her this conversation wasn't over and that getting her out of bed. Um, I guess uh, we did have a conversation when I did come in the house at the second floor. She tried to defuse it. She tried to um, say, hey, we'll just talk about this in the morning or whatever. I don't remember none of that. Um, she also said that I wasn't myself. The way I was talking was very uh, deep and demonic and wasn't wasn't myself. And so I proceeded to hold her um, uh, there for, I don't know how long, we were, like six or seven hours. Uh, people started to, the text messages that started to come in from the people that I had sent it out to. So there were family members, coworkers and everything else. And the problem with that was uh, a lot of people didn't respond the way I needed them to. So they made the situations worse. Um, they were telling me, think about your kids, think about what you're putting us through, think about what I've already been through, think about your family, think of, so basically they were telling me to think of everybody else but myself, right. which was only helping me with my decision of what I wanted to do, because now I was even more of a, they were telling me I was a burden, right. and that's how I was hearing it, I was hearing it, now they, that's not what they meant, that's not their intent, that wasn't what they're, Ill, sure. you know, no, thinking. but what that's you're hearing I at that moment, yes, it. 100%. So, now, Heather, which is my wife, she is the one sitting there trying to diffuse it, talk about, hey, you know, you're making them angry or, hey, it's getting worse. And, and, you know, a lot of other things were said. And so she would be the one to have to ever after each one of these calls, bring me back down um, to call me to where she can try to navigate uh, basically both of us out there because she wasn't just thinking of herself. And um, yeah, so then the police were got involved and the police were fed um, wrong information to the point that, you know, they had shut down schools, they, the neighborhood, they had, um, you know, they had people up in other houses, you know, trained on me. They, they, had, they had made, um, again, a lot of the work I do now is with law enforcement and all that stuff. So uh, mad love for law enforcement. So I love them to death. A lot of my friends are law enforcement. But some of the tactics used back in those days were not of the um, best when you're dealing with a veteran that has seen a lot of stuff and is feeling now he's trapped or cornered or, or you're threatening him. And I felt like I was threatened by some of the stuff that they were saying, which only heightened um, what I was going to do again, where I was going to um, almost have it out with them. Um, and they were talking about how they were going to storm the house and they were going to come and do this and all that. And. I remember telling, um, uh, I'll just call it, continue to call my wife because my fiance, my wife, telling her that, hey, if they do storm this house, they're going to, you know, tear gas it. So lay flat on the ground. They're going to come for me, put this towel over your face. And then because they were like, yeah, we're coming in. And I was like, and I knew how my house laid out. I was like, you can't come in. You don't know the layout of my house. You don't know where I'm at. And by the way, I have a hostage. So how are you coming in? And uh, 
and it was a fatal funnel to my to where I was. So the bad part of that was I was ready to to go at it with them. Would I have lost 100%? I know I would have, but in my mind, I was going to go at it with them if they came in. And I'm sitting there trying to talk to the negotiator. I'm like, hey, I already knew the tactics. I, I've been trained in all these tactics. So I already knew there was a van outside. I already knew my leadership was probably there because of who I was with. I already knew that, you know, there was a command center. I already knew all what, who, where everybody was trained around my house. Like I already knew there was people in the back hill. I knew there was people in my side house because I saw them. And I was like, no, let me talk to somebody else. The negotiator was like, no, you're only talking to me. You're only talking to me. I said, no, there's other people. There's somebody higher than you. Give me somebody else. No, you're only going to talk to me. I said, well, let me talk to my therapist. Because I had been seeing a therapist at the time. It was a family therapist. And they were like, no, no, you're only going to talk to us. And I'm like, no, no, you're not. You're not helping. And um, and so it was it, then this left my wife having to now deal not only with the phone calls of family members and friends and stuff. Now she's trying to talk to the police and say, hey, you're upsetting them. You're making them angry or let me talk to them. Um, at some point through it all, I came back to, to like I am right now. And well, I don't know if I'm still a little woo, but anyways, um, <laughs> you're okay. Am, like, Tom. I'm, you're, I'm, you're like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I'm like, what did I do? What's going on? Oh, and then I'm like, my job is, you know, my job is on the line. I have a, a, the top secret clearance that's on the line now. I'm like, I held you. I'm like, oh, this, please. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, I don't know. I'm so sorry. I'm like, you know, on a, and then all of a sudden, so I let her go and I'm like, Hey, go I'm like, please leave. Like, I'm sorry. And she did it. Um, do you think you would have killed yourself after she left? Yes. Yes. Uh, I definitely would have. Um, and she knew that. So I was sitting against the wall in a fetal position, basically with like, put your knees up by your chest, uh, with the weapon. And I told her to leave. And the police had heard that and said, get out, get out. She's letting you leave. And she did not She knew better. Uh, well, I don't say she knew better. She knew that what was going to happen if she left. So instead, what she did was she sat right in front of my face, like literally right next to me and was like, tell me what's wrong. Just I'll stay here with you. Tell me what's wrong. What is bothering you? And literally, that was the first time that somebody had actually asked me, what do I need? What does Tom need? That was the first time that anybody really like it's not that a matter of I hadn't felt love. My family loves me. Friends love me. But no one really asked Tom how he's doing because I've always had to lead. I was a leader at home. I was a leader in the school because my, you know, I had to help my brothers. My brothers graduated high school. They had never, you know, I was the one that because my parents had not against them, they hadn't graduated. So I'm the one that had to get through high school. And then I went to college. I had to do it on my own. Then I'm a leader in the army. I was with the 82nd. I was with special ops, like all those guys that, you know, that depend like you don't, you are crucial. You are the best. Now you're a family. We love you and all, but you're crucial and everyone's crucial on those guys. And so I never had anybody ask me, what does Tom need? How, how are you? What is wrong with you? And finally somebody was doing that. And it took that moment that that's what I'm saying to fast forward to when my boss said, kill himself to finally someone asked me how I'm doing. And I just unloaded. And what did she, you say to her when she asked, what was your response? I just let her know everything. I was just like, I can't remember all of it. Um, I was just like, you know, there was a lot of things going on with my family life. I had just been recently divorced. Um, so that was an issue. Uh, there was just a lot of personal stuff that was compounded that all of a sudden I couldn't handle anymore. There was, I guess my brain finally said, this is too much for you. You're, you're, you're we're going to shut down. And, um, uh, so yeah, she, I, she got me to take the, the gun apart. I put it up, put it in the safe, put it in the closet. Um, we took our dog, we had a little pug, um, and he was my best friend and he put him down in the basement because I knew basement bathroom, because I knew they were going to come in with dogs and everything. So I didn't want their dog to eat my dog. And, uh, so I, she, we, we leave the door. What? I don't know why am I thinking he's doing that? <laughs> <laughs> For those who are just listening to the audio, Tom's lights keep going out on him, but he's, he's, he's surviving. <laughs> well, we, um, we, uh, she locks arms with me and walks me down the fatal funnel because she knew um, that I, I could kick her out the door and then run back inside. And so she locked her arms on me and walked me out the door. And of course, as soon as I get outside the door, I met with a lot of uh, big dudes. <laughs> <laughs> Who promptly wrestled you to the ground and uh, so on and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. They, 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 um, they have 
have you ever asked your wife after the fact, how did she know what to do? If so, it goes all to what we do now, right? So what we do and everything on that, and people ask her that all the time. And she, she said, really, it was her being selfish. She did not want me to go through with it. It wasn't about her saving her life, about her being able to be, she was being selfish for the person that she loved. No, I I get that. But like, there were very specific things that she did that like, I think for somebody who isn't a trained, unless she is a trained professional, I'm not aware. um, But those are very specific things that in the, just, in, in the therapy world, listened. yeah, well, that's, I guess that's it. But like in she the just, therapy all world, she said was she stopped, she saw how everybody was asking or telling me how they felt, right. but nobody was asking me what I needed. So she broke that cycle by sitting in front of me, asking me, Tom, what do you need? I'm here to listen. I love you. I'm here to, to support you. What do you need? So that's where she goes, where she stopped. She goes, um, she stopped. What she, how, she's got this phrase she uses, and it's beautiful, and I, I, I'll screw it up here. It's something about she. we are tend to listen to speak than listen to be heard or something like that. And it's so she just did the opposite of what everybody's done my whole life is she finally asked, Tom, what do you need? What, what, what do you, you know, what's going on? And I think that's something that we do screw up a lot in. Yeah whether it be professionally or unprofessionally, we, we talk to our friends and if our friends say something, we're like, Oh yeah, but I did that once. And you know, my back hurts and, or I've, I've went to this sports game instead of letting you finish. Well, tell me about your experience at the ball game or why are you in pain? We go, no, man, my back hurts too. And I haven't been able to sleep. And now the other person, if they're really empathetic will now go, Oh yeah, I'm sorry. And they'll not talk about their own because now they're invested in that other person. Right. So they never get the help. And that's how I've always been. By the way, are you, are you the least bit curious why the negotiator never asked you that question? Cause I feel like that's the trained question. The negotiator would ask. Tom, what do you want? They're not, they, they're trained in asking the questions that if I wanted like a helicopter or, you know, a bank and a, a limo <laughs> to get to the helicopter and all that stuff. They're not. Okay. They weren't, okay, they so, weren't asking for emotional so Tom. They, they were just asking for what fit Tom physically wanted. <laughs> so they, they weren't trained in that they are now. So got it. fast forward 12 years, a lot of us in the field that do what we do now, they are trained. They have a crisis intervention team. They have mental health teams that go out now. A lot of those people are trained in those um, uh, CITs and stuff like that. Officers are trained in that. So now they have realized that they need. That's a powerful question. It is not just about banging the door, going in and getting the target. It is now, what is the person going through? We can de-escalate this probably really quickly over the phone or through the door or or thing like that and bring everyone out peacefully instead of always being old school, like how we are kicking the door down. Does does your wife um, sort of have her own, for lack of a better term, PTSD about that day? Yeah, so she still suffers from anxiety and and stuff that day. But what is awesome about her and, and what we do is she doesn't, we have never held it against each other. She has never said, you know, hey, go go take the, the, the garbage out. And I say, I don't want to take the garbage out. She's like, but you tried to kill me. She never, she never plays the, that card on me ever. Yeah. Like, Hey, you know, I'm hungry. Well, what do you want? What, you know, I'm going to go get Burger King. I want McDonald's. Well, I want Burger King. You try to kill me. Like, no, it's never, it's, you know what I'm saying? It's I don't mean to laugh, but it's just like such a is. response that you're like, yeah, I guess I better go get the damn Burger King then because yeah. I tried to kill you. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, yeah. what, you don't have another card to play against that. Yeah. So she's never, she's never held it against me in, in a way that makes me, um, you know, always like, I'm always sorry for it. Like for me personally, I'm always sorry. I always apologize. I'm always, um, you know, uh, empathetic and, and understand that I've done it, it. What I did was horrible. And what I, what I, what the consequences I should have got from it were what I should have gotten and what, and, and all everything I, I do, I do take ownership for my actions and sure. what I did. So for her to accept that and then to never hold it, against me um is is a huge 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 thing because um a lot of our spouses a are, saint. <laughs> yeah a lot of spouses do hold things against others or will wait for the right time to use it in an argument or something like that 
and it becomes detrimental to the family of course. It detrimental to the relationship. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's great. So she has her own, um, story. She does, um, cause we do now for the past 12 years, travel the world, telling our story from the white house to the VA, to NATO, to Ireland. We're part of every suicide, um, suicide prevention organization across the country. Um, we're consulted for all the stuff because really I'm not the star of this show. I'm not the star of this program. Like, uh, really they are, my wife and son are, because they're the ones that have to deal with me on a daily basis. They're the one that have to deal with, um, a lot of the stuff that I still deal with that I, um, that, you know, I'm not medicated. Um, I use a lot of holistic means because I was medicated, um, a lot when I was at Walter Reed, um, when I was supposed to be kicked out of the military and I wasn't. Um, but they gave me a lot of medications. I have a lot of side effects to this day. And yeah. again, just again, mental, I, I don't, um, I, I'm not mad at them. I'm not, I don't um, talk bad about medications. I think if you're on medications, I, my philosophy on it is um, I don't blame them because they were doing the best with what they have, right? They're trying to use whatever's out there to try to help us. And each, each individual is different. So it's going to be taken differently. And then on this flip note is, I'm not mad at medications. What I'm thinking is my philosophy is we can mix a lot of holistic stuff that instead of being on 12 bottles of medicines, we probably could do it down to six. If you include other holistic things, like for me, I like playing video games and doing photography. And so those are my coping mechanisms to reset my brain. When I don't know what's wrong with it, I use those, but some people need medication for sure. real. And yeah. I, I don't doubt that. And I'm just saying, I think we could, Add in working out, going for bike rides, reading, doing doing other things that just helps reset your brain to be able to conquer some of the issues that we that we deal with. Uh, two part question: Did you ever find out from anybody in the medical field what may have, uh, f- you know, made that switch flip and you know made the attack happen? And two, in retrospect, was there anything that you could have done or could have seen? happening that led to it, you know, happening. And you know, you follow what I'm saying? Like, was there, could you have anything been done to prevent it? Could you see it coming in retrospect, realizing, Hey, this was a seminal moment that led to this event. So, um, what was the first one? It was, uh, <laughs> what was it? Were you ever actually di- like diagnosed Did anybody ever so, clinically be able to tell you why you snapped or, or what it was? If you look at my paperwork, yes, I have a uh, PTSD, severe PTSD, anxiety, depression, all the good stuff. The military gave Check. me. Um, yeah, um, that's what they're claiming it is. Uh, they, uh, Walter Reed said, you know, you got PTSD. It's all your combat experience, all the stuff you've done, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I loved all my deployments. I was not one deployment that I did not answer truthfully when I came back on the sheets. Um, there isn't anything that I regret, um, but they say because of those. Now to the second part of it, um, which kind of leads to the beginning is I had a lot of traumatic small events happened that year that led to it. So now that, excuse me, now that I'm educated in this field, I can look back. But at the time, I thought everything that I was doing was the best that I could do to handle those situations. Unbeknownst to me, my brain had a different opinion. So my brain told me that I was doing everything I could, but in the background, it was burning itself out. And I now with the knowledge I have of, of looking back and, and being able to do it now I did, but at the time, no, I never saw it coming. No one saw it coming. No one, if you, even still, if you ask some of my family members, they still don't believe it ever happened. Um, because it's too hard for them to comprehend that I would do something that drastic to myself or somebody else, that it is still a, um, thing that isn't talked a lot about within my family. They know what I do. They know the help that I'm doing for people. They know what it's done for my family and, and helping and what we've done, but it's still not something uh, a few, a lot of them are able to talk about because it's, it's, un, it was uncharacteristic of me of what they've always seen me as, or, and maybe they don't want to see me in that, in that light as, as being that in, but it's not who I am right now. It's like that, that seven hours, didn't define my 46 years, right? It, it now had molded me into a, I think, a better person. A, a, I think it actually helped me um, as, tra- as tragic as that event is. I think it helped me become 
who I am today and help me be able to help a lot, lot, lot more people than I would have ever helped. Uh, I'd, prior like, to that. I'd like to substitute the word transformational in, in place mm-hmm. of tragic. Um, and, yeah. and yes, um, your wife was a, obviously a moment that is going to stay with her for the rest of her life. But um, tragedy always implies that, that, something ended badly and there's a positive end to this. So uh, if you allow me, I'll substitute transformational event as opposed to tragic. Uh, That said, are you surprised that the military let you hang around? (laughs) Cause I'm frankly shocked. I'm everybody. Especially back then. Like, like, you know, right now I I think we get through this in 2010, the PTSD word was just starting to crack the surface of our lexicon, right? Like we just started really, acknowledging it. No, by the way, we had been at war for nine years at that point in time, but you know, nothing like the military and the department of defense being a little slow on the uptake. That's not nothing new to anybody. (laughs) All that said, I mean, I'm genuinely shocked that they, because at that point in time, I thought you would have easily been medically discharged. So I was, I was supposed to be. So I went, um, I went through every program. I was in the psych ward. I went through outpatient therapies. I was part of the wounded warrior um, side. I was with, with 25 of our, our best warriors that had amputees and had other mental health issues and had been through some traumatic, traumatic um, stuff in, in both combat and whatever. And I was humble to be with them. But I felt that I wasn't done. I felt that I still had to uh, be able to give back to the military. And I thought I could still stay things. So I had to go through a lot more testing, right? I had to go through a lot, a lot of, a lot of extra stuff to, for the, for the, be even be, re, have my stuff reviewed. I'm still shocked that I wasn't, you know, put in jail. Um, you know, I, I should have technically first off been in jail. I, when I came out of all of it, I was, um, I was taken to a hospital. Uh, they did a urine test, a blood test, alcohol test, every test, everything, and nothing came, nothing, everything came back negative. Cause I hadn't, and then been, I hadn't been drinking. I don't do drugs. None of that stuff was in my system. And so, and because I had come out of the house cleanly because my wife didn't file charges against me and all this stuff, they let me go. And I self-referred myself to Walter Reed because they were going to let me go home. And I was like, I think I messed up. And so I checked myself into Walter Reed and, um, and I went through all the programs and all that stuff and all that. And then they were like, okay, well, you all 25 have made it as far as we can. You all again retired. And I was like, man, I think I could still fight. So I fought to stay in, um, had some great um, nurses and stuff and, and people behind me to help me, um, you know, f- uh, continue to do more testings. And I was approved to stay in the military. And so, yeah, I was shocked. And then the other half, like I told you, I have a top secret clearance. And so I had to go and get, um, go through that. And they were, more they were a lot easier than i thought they were going to be on me they just said hey with all the programs you've been through and all the stuff you're doing we're gonna um we're gonna put you on probation basically so you still got all your clearances we're just gonna don't screw up in the next year and then the military ended up sending me into a first arm position (laughs) well well actually back up so when i came out of the psych ward and all that stuff i had been seeing a great doctor in maryland he was a great, great dude. Like this is, so this is where the transition of my, my thinking for therapy, therapy starts. Therapy is one of the most crucial things you'll ever do because you're sharing secrets with somebody you've never shared with anybody, possibly your spouses, possibly your family. Right. So that keenness of you being able to have that relationship with that person. So I shouldn't have stopped looking for somebody in 2008 when my, when my boss did what he did, Mm -hmm. I should have kept looking for one, not one to say, Tom, you know what? You're the best. The rest of the world is messed up. You're right. You're great. But somebody that's going to compliment me and put me in my place when I need to be put in, but also give me the help that I need when I help it. Right. And that's what I finally got was this guy wasn't. I got orders to go to a unit that was about to deploy. So literally I was coming out of all of this stuff. And three months later, I was going to be deployed again. And the doctor was like, hey, man, I see you got orders. You're going to deploy soon because that unit is deploying soon. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. He's like, he's like, are you excited? I said, yeah. He's like, watch. He picked up the phone, called the army. Yeah. Those orders you gave Tom. Yeah. Cut those. He needs a unit closer to home and no, he's not deploying until I tell you he's deploying. I was like, what are you doing, man? Now I look back, he was doing it for my own safety. I wasn't, even though I thought I was in the right space, I thought I'd been in the right space for a long time before that. Right. He said no. And so um, I ended up getting put in a, a unit in Maryland and they ended up making me a first sergeant. So they, you know, they ended up making me a first sergeant. Nice consolation um, prize. So I'm like, nobody really knew. There was a lot of rumors and everyone kind of knew probably what I'd been through, but 
no one even knew knew. So I wanted everyone to love me or hate me for being a first sergeant, not because of my past. And so not even my soldiers really knew knew what had happened. And so September uh, suicide prevention month, September 2012, my boss, my commander was like, I think you should share this with the unit because my unit expanded from uh, all the way from New England uh, down to Virginia. I had troops and civilians everywhere. And so he was like, I think you share it. So I shared it. And the next thing I know, the outpouring of love and support from those soldiers, and civilians and about, hey, um, I need to get some help or I'd never gotten help before. Or, hey, I'm going to deal with this or I need to deal with that kind of is why I'm on the path I'm at right now, because I was like, oh, so my story. So the army must have let me stay in. The bigger picture is that I'm meant to be here to help others, families not go through what I put my family through. So I started seeing as not taking the army for granted of letting me stay and going, ha ha, I got one over on you. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I saw it as, okay, this is my mission. The army saw something in me that I didn't see possibly. And that, okay, cool. So not to squander letting the army keep me. What do I, how can I use my, this, this now, this, the skill I have, this thing that this bad transformation go work for me in my personal life, but also for the military. And so from then on, since that day, we've shared our uh, story is, to units all across the world. Is that when you started getting all the training, the master resilience training, the applied suicide intervention skills training, the mental health training, the, the so, care so as suicide training? The, so it goes back to your question of, did I ever get a diagnosis? And I, to me, those diagnoses to me don't fit me. So I, I've been striving to do research. I strive for more classes. I strive to talk to people because I want to know, right. am I the only one that's gone through this? And by, okay, well, I don't understand what happened to me. And if you look at the stats, the next time I do this, I'm actually going to go through with it. So how do I not become the next stat? And I'm like, okay, well, I, I, I research. Okay. So I, I, and I took all these trainings to learn how to be able to, a lot of people think it was to stop other people. No, it's really to stop me. Like, what do I need to, uh oh, are we going, uh oh, um, how do we, how do we do this so that it doesn't, you know, how do I help me, but I can help others with it. And then I can hear other people's stories and I relate to them that, okay, it's not only me that there's other people going through the same stuff as me. And so that's when all these trainings was, is really was meant to help me put in my toolbox so that if this happens again, what, or these issues arise, what training have I gone through that is going to help pull me out of stuff. And now I just use it to help pull other people out of stuff too. You, you wrote that uh, you want to be that one for someone else. So no one else has to go through what you went through. Tell me what being that one means. So that is referring to my wife. Yes. The only reason I'm alive and the only reason I'm able to do what I, I do is because her ability that day, I don't want to be alive. That was not my plan. That's still like, I still struggle with those. I still have suicide ideations. They just didn't go away. They're not solved. I still have very bad days, but her being that one where I know I can talk to, I can vent to, I can um, be me with is very special. So with that saying is I'm hoping that if there is somebody out there that doesn't have a supportive spouse, a supportive family member, a supportive team member, a supportive whatever, that I can be that one for them. And then I can train them or get them to see that there are other people uh, to, in your Rolodex that are going to support you. Not tell you what you want to hear, not say, Mark, you're the best. No one else would be above you. You're so good. But somebody that in the time of need at seven o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, two in the morning, that Mark can call and say, hey, man, I need to talk. I need my weapons removed. I'm drunk. I am out somewhere and I don't know where I'm at that you know in your Rolodex, you got that one that will pick up that phone at any point and talk you through whatever situation that you are in. Drunk, drugs, on the street, having issues at home, whatever it is, you've got that one person that you know has got your back. And then to be able to say, you know, I got you, man. What do you need from me? Is there any sort of similarity in the feeling <clears throat> and just the feeling um, obviously the work is different, but is there any similarity in the feeling of getting that information from an interrogation on a target? Is there the same sort of elation when you realize you've connected with somebody who might be on the edge and you've now pulled them away? Yes, it's, it's huge. Um, 
being able to connect with somebody on that level when they're that dark and deep has been therapeutic for me. Um, it's also been, I've built a lot of great relationships um, from that. I still, some of the people that I've pulled from the darkness that were actually going to go through with it, I'm still friends with. I still talk to, I still, I'm still considered their mentor or that I talk with and, 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 and help pull them, uh, pull them through or they'll refer people to me. Is, is there any part of the process and training that you use in interrogation that you apply to talking to somebody who's on the edge? Yeah, because my wife will say it all the time. She's like, stop using your stuff on me. Um, <laughs> um, don't you play those Jedi mind tricks on me, young man. Yeah, and I, to me, it's, <laughs> I've been doing it for so long that I don't know that I'm doing it sometimes. Ah. But it's also my passion. I really don't want anybody to ever go through what I went through or family to go through what I went through. So my passion, along with my skills um, in that, I think have have, have gone to me why I'm, I'm good at what I do, because right. I really genuinely care about these people. You're not a number to me. I'm not just going to give you a resource and send you off to it. I'm going to follow up with you. I'm going to ask you, did that resource work? And if it didn't work, then you need to let me know. So I can scratch off my Rolodex and find a new one. So how do we, how do we work through this together? Whereas a lot of people, usually it's, I've saved you, you'll never hear from me again, or I'll just give you this resource and I don't care. Um, me is I'm very invested in the people that I work with, with the people that I help, because I see myself in every single one of these people. And I want everyone to have a better life or a better family. And I really, for me, it's about what I would have done to, so we have seven kids. Oh. Um, we have, yeah. So I, we're, they range from 26 to about to be 10. So if you want one at any age, I got one for you to rank. I, I have twins. I'm always willing to give one away. So, you know, um, I just, I, listen, I made another one just look like that one. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So there you go. So I, I totally understand. I didn't understand what I, I didn't understand what I would have done had I taken two parents away. Um, cause she has an ex-husband. I have an ex-wife. Yeah. They still would have had families, but we would have took, I would have taken, um, six kids, uh, parents away from them. And I didn't know that. And I really never put that in perspective until we had um, our, our, our child that we have together. Right. His name's Holden Chance. Um, he was born, actually, what's funny is, so my, my date, uh, a live date is 3 November, 2010. Right. He was born 1 November, 2012, brought home 3 November, 2012. So for me, that day doesn't have to be a dark day anymore because right. I see him. And um, so he's our son together. So the funny story about him is um, because we had six kids, we got married and we were like, she has four, I have two. And we're like, no, we don't want more kids. We want to travel. We want to do this stuff. I was like, okay, cool. So in the military, I went and got the procedure done. And uh, then about six months later, she goes, she goes, (laughs) wait a second, we don't have a kid together. So I got it reversed. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to tell me like it didn't take. And one got no. through. One, one, one ended up making no. a jailbreak so, for it. Well, so I got it reversed. I get a phone call going, hey, Tom, you know, everything went well. The surgery went well. Everything's going good. But we don't know if you're going to be able to have kids. Um, we don't think you're going to be able to. But keep trying. Um, I said, okay, cool. Hung up the phone, started laughing. We had just come from the hospital. Wife was pregnant. Oh, <laughs> So like any good interrogator, you already know the answer to the question before you're asking it. Right. So his name is Holden because of catcher in the rye, Holden Caulfield. Oh, yes. And And his middle name is Chance because he wasn't supposed to happen. (laughs) So his middle name is Chance. And what's unique about him is we know that children that live in households that have mental health, alcohol or drugs, it's really an elephant in the room and they don't know what to do. And they really hide in their rooms and they don't ever get added into the equation of how to help the family. Um, because they don't think they can. Um, just like you and me, if our if our locations where we're at had an active shooter, I would be the first one to try to go and solve the solution because that's what I'm trained to do. That's what I know to do. I don't. I never ran from fire. I always ran to it. I always said, "Let's go get it." I never ran from it. I wanted my son to have that same mentality. I didn't want him to see me scared, angry, staring off, and be scared of me. I didn't want him to go, "Wow, I'm going to go hide or do it." Instead, I've trained him in assist. I've trained him in my triggers. I've trained him in all those skills that you said that I have. I've trained him in those. Why? Because I wanted him to be an asset to the family. So now he, when he sees me off, he comes up to me, dad, can we play? Dad, do you want to go? Do you want to talk? Again, not the life that I want from at 10 years old, but what I've done for him now is instilled 
that he can't be, don't be scared of me, how to deal with me, how to help me when I don't know how to help myself. What that's also done for him is because we know that children down to elementary school are now killing themselves, having issues. He now has the skill sets to know what's wrong with him. And thirdly, he is now an asset to his school. He now can talk to his peers because even though his peers may not talk to their family, may not talk to the teachers and they're having issues. My son is now able to identify those and other kids and talk to them from a peer to peer level of, Hey man, I see you don't have anyone to play with. You want to play with me? Hey, you want to talk? And what he's done is able to turn those kids over to either the school or over to us to get those kids help. And so now he is, he is it using those and he's, he's, definitely matured a lot for being only 10 years old and um, being able to do a lot of stuff in that where he's able to a lot of recognize and not be scared the stuff that's in, wrong with him if he's having a bad day if he doesn't understand he now is, feels comfortable coming to me or his mother and going hey i need to talk about this i don't feel good strong parents make strong kids uh one more question i'm asking in reference to Suicide. You know, former guest in the show, Mike Jason, he's, re, he's a retired colonel, uh, somebody who I respect the hell out of. Um, you know, he's always tried to, he, he's pushed this assertion, and I agree with him 100%, um, that, you know, the amount of veteran suicides that happen due to them simply just owning a privately owned weapon uh, increases the chance of suicide phenomenally. Is that something that you would necessarily agree with as an assertion? Well, I mean, if we want to go off research and data, I mean, DOD just put out their new their new stuff saying, you know, it's all weapons uh, accessible. Yeah, because why weapons are the easiest one we're trained in them. One is the quickest way. So if you have access to weapons and you're trained in it and it's the easiest way because none of us want to go out painfully. Not at one point that I think, well, maybe I should really like make this last longer. <laughs> that really, you know, that doesn't make sense, right? If you're really in that mode and in that mentality and that, that frame of thinking, you're going to try to make sure it's as fast as possible. You're not going to sit there and make it last longer. So my deals on the weapon is I still have my weapon. I don't discourage anybody taking anybody with mental health weapons away. Depend And again, it's situational based. Sure. Obviously, if they've got true, serious, psychotic, you know, whatever, and all these big time ones. Yes. But for the average person, it's a matter of owning up, being able to know my weapon. I, so I have a Sig Sauer um, that didn't have doesn't have a safety. I used to have hollow points in it. Um, they used to sit loaded right near my bed. Yeah. Why? Because if an intruder comes in, I need to be able to take care of the target. But now that my incident has happened, I do believe in separating my ammo from my magazine. My weapon has a lock on it. My weapon is now in a locks in a in a in a case that has locks on it. My weapon is now up in a shelf in the closet. Why? Because that gives me time and space. Research has shown that time and space will be the key to this Got time it. and space shows that by the time I get out of whatever I'm at, get off the couch, get out of bed or do whatever. I've got to get up. I got to find the keys. I got to get the, the case open. I've got to unlock the gun. I've got to put the ammo in the thing. By the time I do all that, I've come research has shown we, we probably came out of the reality has hit us back to, is this really what we want to do? So the big push now is for just time and space. The other part goes back to my thing with the one. If I'm really feeling I'm off that bad or I'm drinking that bad, being able to call Mark and say, Mark, I'm really having a bad night. I really trust you. Can you come over and secure my weapons? Can you can you do that for me? And that's already something that's been made up well before, like when we're in good state. Like, hey, Mark, I, I really want you to be on my, you know, on my, you know, you know, I have issues um, and I want you to be on my on my contact list. And if I call you. Are you comfortable enough to um, do all this stuff for me? And are you comfortable storing my weapons, you know, just for the time being until, you know, you and I, because I trust Mark, you know, I trust you that you're not going to take my weapons and give them to the police. You're not going to just hide them from me that you and I have already talked in a normal state that when I'm not in a good state that I trust Mark to come and do the right thing. And that when I come back and Mark and I talk and Hey, I'm doing good now, man, I'm like, life's better. I got that resolved, whatever it was, we're good then Mark can give me my weapons back. Um, so I think there's a lot of other um, ways in, in the community, the mental health community is really pushing this new narrative because the old narrative went very, very bad, very, very fast. 
Right. And I was very, uh, very vocal about that when I was talking to a lot of my mental health friends is like, you guys have a lot of damage control to do because of you just saying you're going to come take my weapon. That's never going to happen in this country. Right. Right. Um, the book you wrote, Guts, Grit and the Grind, a mental mechanics manual, 10 advanced uh, mechanical tips to repair and overhaul after a breakdown. Uh, obviously, I mean, the impetus of the book is, is part of your own story, but there is more to it. Uh, so kind of give me the background and when you wrote so, the book and how and why. So I am not the writer. Okay. I am a contributor to it. So it's a four series book um, and it's highly recommended, right? Um, so I was asked to participate in the last book, uh, the fourth book installation. So I have about 10 pages in there and it's a it's about my family and our story. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's um, basically a bunch of guys, firefighters, veterans, first responders, all that sharing our stories of lived experience. And what I do now is basically called lived experience storytelling, going and sharing my story, uh, no matter the criticism I get to help others not ever go through that. Right. And so that's what that book is about. It's about all of us sharing our stories of our struggle. But then how do we get through that? How do we fight through it? Um, and so I was very honored to be uh, in this uh, in this uh, installation in this in this book. Um, but there's a ton, a ton of great, great stories. And a lot of my friends are, are contributors to that book. Um, so it was a great way because it's a great stock and stuff for a Christmas gift to be able to really for spouses, for children to read about what is if you're if your husband's a first responder, if your husband's a veteran, if your husband's in the uh, blue collar uh, jobs your husband does all this kind of stuff what is some of the struggles he's gone through but then also how's he recovered from that was he was he gained from that um and that's kind of what that book's based off of all right pathways to hope uh is where you're at now the director of it uh and that that specifically works with incarcerated veterans so how do you get involved with them what's the work doing now i mean tell us about that so when I was retiring, um, what, and I retired because the army said after 26 years, you got to go find some other job. Otherwise I would have stayed in the army forever because I loved it. Um, but at some point they said, you got to go find something else. So I got out, I wanted to get in the mental health field still and stay within this realm. Um, and so I had a friend who wanted me to come to Texas. Um, the problem is Texas, even though it's got a large veteran population, the administration portion for veteran suicides is not a big division. And so she knew of a position that was opening up. And so she's like, by any means, get Tom into Texas, or at least we've trapped him in Texas. Um, and uh, so I got linked up with my boss, uh, Miss Brinker for One Community USA. And she goes, hey, I'm running this program uh, that's uh, called Pathways of Hope, helping offenders pursue excellence. And what we're doing is we're going into the jails. And um, luckily here in Fort Worth, there's, um, oh, oh, here we go again. <laughs> No. Lights back on. Good job. Uh, here in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, the, uh, one of the facilities actually has a vet pod and a reentry pod. So the pod has got 24 veterans in it. Um, and so what I do is I go in there and I basically share my story. And with sharing my story, I, that's how I get to relate with them. And then what happens after that is um, we offer a 40-hour class. So a lot of these guys are not what social media and the news puts them out as, right? A lot of these right. guys just made a wrong mistake, went the wrong path, have no support, no whatever. And so we teach a class, a 40 hour class, that's um, basically about everything from financing to parenting, to mental health, to job disciplines, all of this stuff to re reprogram their brain of how to act um, out in the communities, out in society, regain their family's trust. And then once they do that, because I know talk is talk in jail, they're going to tell me what they want to tell me. And they're going to be like, Tom, oh, we're going to do this. And Tom, I'm going to change. And I tell them right to their face. I'm like, I don't believe you. I don't believe none of you. So what happens is once they get out, that's where the real test is. That's where the, all the struggles of the world happen is when you're outside. And so we, uh, we have a program called journey home. And that's basically a 2.0 version of it in jail. When life is really hitting you in the face, how do we deal with your finances? How do we get you to housing? Because being an incarcerated veteran or just incarcerated person in general does unfortunately have a lot of stigmas and hold you back from yeah. a lot of stuff. And depending on how you got discharged from the military, those affect your benefits. Like I'm dealing with that stuff right now, like Lily as of yesterday uh, with some people. And so, but what's also cool about that is I want the community to be involved. So this isn't about Tom or this is about one community to say, it's about the community. So what I do is I get, um, the community leaders and I get community members to come in and instruct the classes so that they get to see what these guys are actually like and that the guys in the jail actually see the community really cares about them. 
Yeah. And so then we get mentors. So then we add the extra, extra thing on there too, is we get mentors from the community because we also know these guys are going back to some of the same environments that are really bad. And so they're going to go and be around the same drugs, alcohol, wrong people, wrong baby mamas, whatever. And so they need that one. So that is, again, the mentors are from the community that have volunteered their time to basically mentor these guys when they're having a rough time, be that um, call and set those boundaries and help them uh, if they can't find a job or need help with a job or help um, with a struggle or just be that one um, to help them get on the path that they really, really want to be on the path. It's amazing. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll punctuate it with this. Did you ever think in the moments after your breakdown that you could actually be in the spot that you're in right now? Never, never. I'd have never thought where 12 years ago when I was sitting in the psych ward, um, Lily, you know, I'd be in a couple months, but I was sitting in the psych ward. No, I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know. I knew everything around me was crashing down. I knew I'd done something, um, you know, very, very bad. And I did not have no clue that how I was going to do anything. Well, I mean, I would say, you know, you have certainly repaid your debt to society um, for your transgression uh, and then some, you know, and and I think that shouldn't be underscored. You know, you talk about when someone says, hey, Tom, what do you need? You know, let's remind you a little bit that in in all the work, and I know you get caught up in the hustle and the passion of the whole thing, but, you know, there is a genuine thank you that that all of us in the veteran community and in the military community need to give to you because, this work is more impactful than any target you went after than any sort of, you know, mission you accomplished or uh, even to a certain extent, anything you would do in your professional career. Um, This is the stuff that the VA hasn't been able to solve. The active military component hasn't been able to solve. The national guard and reserves haven't been able to solve. uh, And you're, you're making headways in it in, in, in grand strides. And so, you know, again, a heartfelt thank you uh, for being one of those people who is attacking this, right on, head on at the forefront and continuing to try and keep people from having that day, the day that you almost succumb to, uh, end up being their fate as well. And so, you know, I can't, I can't say thank you enough for, for everything that you've done and being willing to share your story. You know, you, you say you're a live storyteller. Well, you know, that, that that's certainly encapsulate, encapsulates what you have went through and sharing that story and doing so here, I think it's just, it, it's flat out amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it can't be easy, but it probably gets easier every single time you do it. So, again, thank you for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, look, again, uh, how can people get in touch with you if they want some help or instruction in veteran suicide? Or, you know, what can they do? Where can they go? Kind of give everybody the spiel of, of you know, the, the basics of it. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I could come to One Community USA, uh, look up our page on there, um, you contact us through there. Um, I can shoot you my email. Um, I'm on, you know, I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. I'm on all the, the, the social media stuffs. Uh, Tcrew76 is my Twitter um, and all that stuff. So, yeah, and then... Uh, just reach out to me. Uh, T Cruz at one dot org is my, is my work email address. Um, yeah, just, I love to continue the conversation if I can help anybody else out somewhere further their programs or get them resources or how we can work together. And especially if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, you know, hit me up so we can collab. No, absolutely. Again, I highly encourage everybody to do so uh, a great resource and, Obviously, somebody who uh, is is one of the more knowledgeable folks on the subject. But again, you know, uh, it's it's so great to get to know you. I'm so glad we connected on LinkedIn, another social media site that you're on, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. because reading about your story and, and seeing everything and that you went through just, you know, this is one of these things that resonates with our audience so much. We, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the combat stuff, but we also spend an equal amount of time now talking about this part of the military experience that sort of has... Uh, quietly yet largely engulfed the military experience, especially for all of us who are, you know, uh, post 9-11 combat vets. You know, it's crazy. I was, uh, and just as a note on the side, I go to drill at Fort Stewart and um, I'm walking around at Fort Stewart during the week last week and I see a whole bunch of E6s and E5s and even E7s and everything. And I notice nobody's wearing a combat patch anymore. And you, mm-hmm. there's two things I forget. One, you can make E6 really fast now. It used to be like when I, when you and I first got in, you weren't getting there before, six, seven years, if that. 
mm-hmm. um, now it's like four years in, it's like, Hey, hey, here's a rocker. Enjoy it. Um, but you know, we, we are kind of far removed from that, that whole generation of combat veterans. We're getting away from those people and a new cycle of folks who are coming in because guys like you have retired guys like me will retire here shortly, eventually, if, you know, as soon Good. as they kick me out. Um, but you know, and those folks are dealing with different issues, but they're also better equipped to deal with this stuff than we ever were. And I think oh, that yeah. that's, that, that, there's a big part of that. So, um, you know, your, your story is so important to everybody. Thank you so much for sharing it. Certainly appreciate it. Uh, continued success with everything um, with that you're doing in, in the post-military world. Continued success with Pathways to Hope and, and continuing to share your story. And send your wife uh, a, a humble thank you for everything oh. that she did for you and is continuing to do for the veteran community. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thomas Cruz, thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell, and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.